Manet. He's one of those painters considered so influential, people don't even bother with his first name. Looking at his work now, it's hard to imagine that Edouard Manet was ever regarded as revolutionary, but he was. His painting, Lunch on the Grass, scandalized the Paris art establishment. But it was only the beginning. Not long after Manet finished his equally provocative Olympia, he did something that changed the course of European art. During the summer of 1864, he went to the beach. So this whole idea of taking a vacation by the sea and swimming like this, mm -hmm. that was new? That was new. Joseph Rischel is one of the curators of Manet and the Sea at the Philadelphia Museum of Art until the end of May. It is the beginning of a kind of tourism we take for granted uh, that really is an invention of the mid-19th century. That other new invention, the railroad train, was what suddenly made beach vacations possible. Trains were a fast, cheap way to get out of the city. Manet began packing up his entire family each summer and spending a month in Bologna, or Berck, on the coast of Normandy. He gets to the sea on vacation, and it's as if he has a sea change. Every day is Sunday. This isn't the heavy stuff. He's out on holiday. He's hanging out. This hanging out and this pleasure, this immense pleasure that you can feel in every picture of painting the sea. It's fluid onto fluid. You're looking at fluid. You're painting fluid. It's a very releasing thing for an artist. Manet loved the sea. He had intended to go into the Navy, but failed the entrance examinations twice. So his parents allowed him to become an artist. But it wasn't till he was in his 30s that he did his first painting of the sea, not standing at the water's edge, in his Paris studio. He can't live by the rules, and he's just changing them by pushing this horizon up. This was Manet's version of what was hot news in June of 1864, the sinking of a Confederate raider, the Alabama, by the USS Kearsarge, Yes, a major Civil War battle was fought off the coast of France. The French government had quietly been supporting the Confederacy. Manet's painting was like a battle, too, in his war against the status quo in French art. By giving you this wall of water, by painting this so freely and fluidly and dramatically, he is pushing the way painting is made way beyond the conventions of his day. Manet's sea paintings, his radical experiments in modernism, drove the critics crazy. They complained his work looked unfinished. Take a look at this, painted in 1873 at the beach. The world is falling apart. I mean, it's a surfer's dream, isn't it? This is the horizon, for God's sake. We're standing on a flat beach and the sea suddenly, the world's gone. Slamping. Compare that with this. Believe it or not, it was painted the very same year. This was the sort of work Manet was doing back home in Paris. Here are some more of Manet's Paris paintings from around that time. In the pressure cooker that was the Paris art world, in today's terms, Manet would be called fashionably edgy. He was affluent from a prominent family and loved women, as his paintings demonstrate. He was associated with whatever was new or unconventional or controversial. The composer of the moment was Wagner. Manet and his friends championed his music.
One of those friends was the poet Baudelaire, who challenged artists to do the unheard of then, paint modern life, which Manet did, and found himself idolized by a circle of younger painters who are now household names. Edouard Manet, at first thought Claude Monet, was trying to capitalize on the similarity of their names, but soon the two were as close as family. Monet was only one of the incredible nonconformist painters in Manet's orbit. Renoir was also one of them, the American painter James Whistler, and Berthe Morisseau, Manet's sister-in-law. Having meals together, traveling together, painting together, feeding off one another's ideas. Soon Manet's disciples were showing together. They rent a space in a good neighborhood in Paris, an arts photographer's studio, and do a show. It causes some sensations. One critic says, these, these guys and girls don't have it together. They can only give you their impression. So that was da, the da, da, birth of impressionism. The birth of impressionism right there. So here we have a painting by Manet of his wife and brother on the beach. If you look very carefully, there are little grains all through here, embedded, there's little, little kind of pebbly things, which are sand. From the beach? From the beach. He is sitting out there, actually, we think, actually painting this from life at the beach. A startling thing to do in 1873. Now, look at this painting. His buddy, Monet doing a very discerningly similar picture, but it's three years earlier than the Manet we've just been looking at. It's impossible, I think, for Manet to have done that picture without knowing Monet's picture of the same very free and open thing. And guess what? Sand all over the place. So just like the Manet, Monet is doing this newish thing going outside and looking, just using his eyes and looking, not inventing. Throughout the spring of 1874, Manet worked alongside Monet and Renoir, and then went to Venice on vacation. This is like a computer printout. It's dab, 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 just like Monet's doing in a way. This is as tight and as impressionistic as Manet's ever going to get. Manet supported the Impressionists, embraced many of their ideas, but refused to show with them. Just when it appeared that they had passed him by, he did them one better, raised the bar with this painting. Superficially, it shows journalist Henri Rochefort escaping the desert island where he has been imprisoned for opposing the French monarchy. What it's really about is the look of the water. Is he just giving you a wall of water that he's been experimenting with for a long time now? But this is his most ferocious depiction of that. And you'll see there is a pink stroke of paint that really is the longest continuous gesture, I think, in any work of art in the 19th century, and it's pink. With that great smear of color, Manet becomes, in the opinion of many art historians, the true father of modern art. I think that's part of his bigness. He just, it is just a very expanding, sort of operatic thing he's doing here. This and another smaller version of it were his last sea paintings completed two years before his agonizing, painful death in 1883 at the age of 51 of syphilis. How ironic it seems now that for much of his life, all Manet really wanted was approval from the critics who ridiculed the revolutionary. At Manet's funeral, his friend Degas said, he was greater than we thought. They are images that engage the mind and thrill the heart. Painted by one of the most beloved artists in the world, Vincent van Gogh.
Huge crowds lined up at the National Gallery to devour all the advance tickets. But don't despair. Curator Philip Conesby says there will still be about 2,000 given out each day. Get there early. We haven't done a survey, but I think you'll find people from congressmen to school children, uh, from bricklayers to bus drivers, will come to this exhibition. They understand that at the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. The paintings, 70 of them, spanning Van Gogh's brief, brilliant 10-year career, are all from the collection of the Van Gogh family. The works sent to the U.S. include famous masterpieces and little-known gems. They are all usually on display in this museum, but it's now shut down for renovations. We traveled there just before it closed to try to understand just what it is about this artist that inspires such passion. Museum director John Layton. Instead of uh, capturing the ordinary, he seeks to, to capture the extraordinary. And there's always a, a sense of uh, animation, of uh, a larger picture, if you like, uh, in his work. The million people who come to the Van Gogh Museum every year come, of course, for the undeniable beauty of the paintings here. But they also come because of the mythology, the image of Van Gogh as a madman painting masterpieces. That myth has been fed by movies. This film, Lust for Life, made 40 years ago, helped engrave it on the world's psyche. There is no doubt that Van Gogh went through severe bouts of mental illness. But art historians hope this exhibit will make people think differently about Van Gogh. You need to know, for example, that here was a, a rather intellectual person who was fluent in reading and writing three languages, Dutch, English, and French. He read enormously. He read all the great novelists of the time. His sensibilities honed in the landscapes of his native Holland, Van Gogh turned to painting in 1880, at age 27, after failed attempts to work as an art dealer, a preacher, and a teacher. At first, he concentrated on scenery, beach scenes, and boats, farmhouses. But he began experimenting, working while he fought depression and rejection by women he tried to court. He was frequently discouraged, both in his personal life and his work. Still, he wrote, I am privileged among many others. I have found in my work something which gives inspiration and zest to life. About the potato eaters, I have tried to make it clear how these people eating their potatoes under the lamplight have dug the earth with those very hands they put in the dish. You would not call this picture beautiful. No, I think it's frighteningly ugly, I think is the uh, way one would uh, describe it. But I think that's, of course, part of its uh, appeal, those uh, gnarled hands. And it is an attempt to get across the hardship of the, uh, the, the daily life that these people lived. In 1887, Van Gogh was brought to Paris by his brother Theo, an art dealer who was Vincent's sole financial support and the champion of his work. He discovered the light, bright palette of Impressionist painters. He discovered their habit of working out of doors. So his art becomes lighter, brighter, more intense in color. He doesn't really fully embrace the Impressionist style of painting, though, does he? No, I think that he was a bit skeptical about Impressionism because he saw it as being an art that really just celebrated the passing moment. Uh, Van Gogh was a really very serious painter in the sense that he uh, had more serious meanings and more serious emotions that he wanted to convey in his art. But though his time in Paris led him to try new subjects and styles, he found big city life too stressful. So he went to live in the small village of Arles in southern France. When he got to the south of France, he saw in nature this incredible blue sky, the intense heat of the sun, the golden cornfields. He works on technique, color, and brush stroke. His work is still not selling. In fact, he would sell only a few paintings in his lifetime. But he writes to Theo, I have a terrible lucidity at moments 
when nature is so beautiful. I am not conscious of myself anymore, and the pictures come to me as in a dream. He is constantly trying to define himself. There are seven self-portraits in the U.S. exhibit. Sometimes he uh, portrays himself as uh, the avant-garde artist uh, with his palette in his hand behind his uh, easel. And on another occasion, there he might be with his straw hat, being the peasant out in the fields. It's a sort of self-exploration in a way. He's uh, not only uh, painting himself, but he's trying to find himself. He fixes up the famous little yellow house in Arles to share with the volatile French painter Paul Gauguin. But even as Van Gogh is painting some of his most beautiful works, the two men quarrel. Van Gogh, in a fit of depression, cuts off a piece of his ear and commits himself voluntarily to a mental asylum where he paints foreboding images like Wheatfield with a reaper. It was here, to the small village of auvers sur oise about 30 miles northwest of Paris, that Van Gogh finally came. He said he was trying to find serenity. Indeed, in the village and the golden countryside, he finds a degree of peace and clarity. He paints almond blossoms for Theo's new son. But finally, his illness, now believed to be a form of epilepsy, overwhelms him. The ominous wheat field with crows was one of his last paintings. In July of 1890, at age 37, he commits suicide. He is buried in the cemetery in Auvergne. And the village has now become a shrine to him. The room he died in. The places he painted. Oh, yeah. Beckoning the same ardent fans who are pouring into the National Gallery. Why is Van Gogh so beloved? What is there about him and his art that touches us so? He wasn't painting for connoisseurs and collectors, but for ordinary people with whom he identified. And I think they have a very genuine appeal for that reason. What would Van Gogh have made of all of this? Well, maybe he would not be completely surprised. He once wrote, I feel a power in me to do something. I see that my work holds out against other work. Give your heart and soul to me and life will always be. It's easy to imagine being in Paris, hearing an Edith Piaf song, sipping champagne, seeing a painting by Claude Monet. But this is Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago, where through Thanksgiving, the largest, most comprehensive retrospective of Monet's vast 60-year career will be on display. a richness to the painting as if, as if they were gifts to somebody, I mean, not to anyone in particular, but to, uh, eventually to all of us. Curator Charles Stuckey had to convince 66 museums and 37 private collectors from around the world to lend their Monets. They range from the huge 1866 painting, Luncheon on the Grass, which has never been seen outside Europe to 31 of the water lily paintings, which consumed the artist during the last 20 years of his life. James Wood is the museum's director. The surface of the pond becomes a mirror of the sky and the clouds and really the whole universe. So as he becomes more and more specific, in a way his subject becomes more and more infinite. If you see one wheat stack, you've seen them all, or are they different at different times of the day? Because Impressionism, the style Monet pioneered, seemed so familiar, many people believe they already know this artist. His ability to capture the glance of the eye with the rapid stroke of the brush. He's taking the things that we know every day, but giving them a whole new look and making us look at things in a very different and new way. Let's go look at one other thing. 
But this exhibit is also a window on the man. He was an incredibly physical human being, and he would do anything to get the picture he wanted. A window that's been flung wide open in a new biography by art historian Paul Hayes Tucker. We can tell from his letters that he was a difficult man uh, because at the same time he was very sensitive, so he was a very divided kind of personality. In the paintings of Camille, Monet's first wife, and Jean, the son she bore three years before they married, Tucker sees anything but domestic bliss. There seems to have been some kind of very curious relationship between the two. There's no evident warmth, there's no sense of devotion between the two, particularly in that image of uh, Camille in that red kerchief. Monet later married Alice Hoshti, a woman he met when painting these turkeys for the man to whom she was then married. One can't help but feel that there is a very tenuous, perhaps not unintended, a relationship between these turkeys there in the foreground and, in fact, the cuckold husband of Mr. Hoshide. Um, it is only a supposition. Again, there's no uh, exact evidence, but it is one of the uh, more humorous pictures that, uh, that Monet painted. But it was the work that was central to Monet, the work and the yes. money it brought in. In the 1870s, uh, when Monet is 30 years old, he was making a considerable amount of money, essentially what doctors and lawyers were. The problem was that he was spending a great deal of money. He moved into a more expensive house. He ordered his wines from outside the local uh, vineyards. Uh, and he liked to live well. So there are constant cries of poverty. By the 1880s, Monet was making enough money to move to his beloved Giverny. Today, tourists flock to his gardens, where he created an astounding 350 water lily paintings. The artist used his wealth to protect the spot, bribing the town fathers to prevent the construction of a chemical plant. And then there was that dusty road that ran next to his water lilies. One of the jobs of one of his five gardeners was to dunk the water lily pads to be able to remove the dust from them so it would sparkle and be beautiful. And he therefore paid to have the road paved so the dust would uh, obviously not rise. And not settle on his water lilies. And not settle on his water lilies. At times, even Monet's friends, Edgar Degas for one, complained that he'd sold out, doing strictly commercial art. Monet undoubtedly cocked an ear to that market. There is absolutely no doubt. No one disputes the fact that Monet was also a businessman, a crafty entrepreneur. And today, this museum is following his example, using this exhibition to sell both the art and the Art Institute. In fact, the museum boasts that this vast selection of Monet clothing, crockery, and even Christmas ornaments marks its largest merchandising effort ever, all to help boost membership and raise money at a time when federal and state dollars are disappearing. Director James Wood. The more people who come and enjoy and learn from this place, the better. Special exhibitions obviously are events which draw even more people. And who knows, a century after he created these canvases, Monet, the merchandiser, probably would agree. Someone like Mr. Monet would probably find it to be quite appropriate, uh, particularly if he got a cut.
The painter whose bold works these are is Camille Pissarro, one of the founders of the Impressionist School. The Jewish Museum in New York is currently exhibiting a retrospective of his work organized by the Israel Museum of Jerusalem. What you see here is basically the formation of a new pictorial style, idiom, language, whatever you want to call it. You just have to remember when you see those paintings that when they were first seen by the public in the mid-19th century, or in the 1870s, um, they were completely jarring with the usual uh, type of art which the public was used to seeing. Pissarro is central to the making of the Impressionist enterprise. That just goes without saying. Norman Clayblatt is curator of fine arts at the Jewish Museum. Pissarro was one of the great Impressionist painters who forged with Renoir, Degas, Cezanne, Manet, Monet, the whole notion of Impressionism as a new style, a new technique, and a new subject matter. For centuries, most artists had concentrated on painting the famous and the grand. Pissarro turned his brush to the unknown and the commonplace. Every day, uh, reality, no names of the people, no names of the houses often, you know, we, we don't know what we're look, looking at. Uh, we know that it's a small village outside Paris and that's about it. Uh, so he paints banality, but in this particular painting, he does so with a very monumental uh, type of device. By the 1870s, factories were sprouting in the classic French landscape, and Pissarro was capturing the discordant scene with a few deft strokes. You have this, this uh, smoke interaction with the clouds, and look at the way it is uh, slowly dissolving into the clouds. You know, that is so superbly achieved. Ten years later, in 1881, Pissarro was experimenting with a style startlingly unlike anything that had come before. The idea of using a brush stroke independently as, as, as a unit is something that you can see almost at work here. Each brush stroke is articulated differently. It's almost like you, you can see, it's almost knitted like a, like a piece of tapestry. There is no easy way to pigeonhole Camille Pissarro. Born in 1830 in the Virgin Islands, he studied and lived most of his life in France. Of Jewish heritage, he was defiantly irreligious. And although he was an outspoken radical and anarchist, his paintings were not overtly political. They were stunningly innovative. Look at this painting of a village poultry market from 1882. When Pissarro looks at society at large, he picks up these moments, these rather privileged moments, where the whole of society or of its representatives gets together and, and just interacts. Around the turn of the century, old now, but with greater financial security than he had ever known, this painter of rural landscapes and country life began to paint urban scenes from hotel windows. Pissarro was not so unconventional that he did not paint a few portraits of his children. Mm -hmm. 
and just before his death in 1903, this one of himself. The National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa has a spectacular new home. It overlooks the Ottawa River and Parliament Hill where the gallery first began in a remodeled two-room workshop 108 years ago. And to help inaugurate the new building came paintings and prints and sculpture from more than 100 collections in 12 countries around the world. For a grand retrospective exhibition, the first of its kind in 50 years of the works of Edgar Degas. Two well, another one down. That's it. Degas was one of the giants of 19th century art, for some, the uncontested master. Many scholars argue that modernism begins with Degas. His career spanned almost 60 years, and the immense exhibition reveals a continuing passion, inspiration, and courage. He was not a voyeur. He was just interested in capturing daily tasks, and they're not even aware that the viewer is there. ever since the little girl of 14 years who was 14. He doesn't use young models, you know, all those, as I've said, are older. Now he uses this. Now whether it was to give a feeling of tenderness, I don't know. The notion with which we began was that in the popular imagination, the guy is essentially the painter of dancers. It's the first thing that comes to everybody's mind. And the guy was much more than that. Michael Pantazzi is associate curator of European art at the National Gallery. The other thing was, of course, that uh, dancers belong mostly to his middle period, the period when, in fact, he's associated with the Impressionists. He had an exceptionally interesting early production, an absolutely dazzling late work. So we tried to do the most uh, sensible thing possible in the circumstances, that was to do justice to the gods he is in the popular imagination, while at the same time uh, making very sure that the early and the late work was going to be very well represented you go through the exhibition and you discover that he was a much, much broader personality than one ever even suspected him to be. Uh, devastatingly keen portraitist, um, somebody who certainly observed the modern scene with the most incisive eye imaginable. They're certainly extremely sensual. 
the most sensual part of it all is that in some way they don't seem to play up to the audience. It's one of those rare instances in which looking at these women bathing, drying themselves, combing them, their hair, you, you look at somebody absolutely unselfconscious. This week, the exhibition will open in the new Tisch Galleries in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. It's not likely a show of such range will be seen again. When the god died in 1917 at the age of 83, he had some 2,500 paintings and drawings in his studio, some of them being reworked 20 or 30 years after he had worked on them the first time. Even after he had sold a painting, Degas' almost maniacal insistence on truth and accuracy would often lead him to try to take it back. The most extreme forms are, of course, oil paintings, which he has produced, which he has sold, and which, two or three years afterwards, he does everything he can to uh, repossess. And he's prepared to do absolutely anything, not to have something in circulation with which he is less than pleased. He takes them back and he either retouches them or uh, adds a strip of canvas to enlarge them or uh, sometimes uh, uh, infinitesimally small transformations which are almost unnoticeable to the, uh, to the uh, eye. There's another picture of an orchestra uh, uh, playing before a stage on which uh, ballet dancers are uh, performing. And uh, that, in fact, has been uh, drastically altered. He could be very pleased with what he did, too. I mean, just stop exactly the moment one should have stopped without adding one extra touch of paint. The painting may seem unfinished, but for him, it was about as far as it should go and no further. Draw lines, lots of lines, and you will become a good artist, the Peter Ingres reportedly told Degas. He was um, really a self-taught painter, and one of the ways he taught himself was by making these copies. At the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale, or in the Louvre, he would go before a painting with an easel, and, or pad and pencil and make a drawing there. Jean Sutherland Boggs headed the committee that selected the works for the exhibition. And he was a very imaginative copyist. One of the things in the exhibition, which was after a, is after a drawing in the Uffizi in Florence, which was then attributed to Leonardo, a uh, painting of a woman, young woman, very beautiful, very serene young woman, has a lot of Degas in it. And it's suggested by Henri Loiret, who wrote about it in the catalog, that he really projected himself and tried to translate into paint what Leonardo might have done. He's a very intellectual artist. He's a very restrained artist at times. And looking at his work takes a lot of, of concentration. He's an artist of the greatest range of his generation. Late in his life, his eyesight failing, Degas told a young painter, it is all very well to copy what you see, but it is better to draw what you see in your mind.
she was modern as a painter, modern in her subject matter, modern in her treatment of, of familiar themes. As an American and a woman, artist Mary Cassatt was a rarity among the French Impressionist masters. Cassatt was very interested in general in the issue of women's roles, whether they were out and about in Paris and free to go to the opera or free to uh, go and buy a new hat, or in their most familiar role, uh, not quite so free to stay home and take care of children. When did you first start studying Mary Cassatt? Well, I, uh, not that Curator Judith Barter titled her exhibit, Mary Cassatt, Modern Woman, even though the images at first glance seem old-fashioned and overly sweet. Her depictions of this kind of tenderness, this kind of physicality of motherhood between mothers and children um, was quite new and quite modern and, and, uh, and of its time, the emphasis on biological mothers taking responsibility for their children. Debuting at the Art Institute of Chicago, it is the first major retrospective of Cassatt's work in 30 years. When you first look at this picture, you see the primary figure, but then you look here and you see another figure behind. And then you become aware of the fact that it's the same figure, which means she's seated in front of a huge mirror. And there are just all these different levels of seeing going on. The appeal of Cassatt convinced yes, curator Barbara Weinberg to design a companion to the Chicago exhibit at New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art. Some of the self-confident insistence about finding a place for herself in this very tough artistic world of the late 19th century in Paris is encoded in these works. She's not just portraying delicate or overly genteel women. She's portraying people who are molding young children and teaching them, nurturing them, bathing them, doing whatever's necessary with their own powerful hands, powerful bodies, powerful minds even. They also do not make direct eye contact with us. They look off to the side, giving us the feeling that we have interrupted something private, a private moment that these are women who are not posed, they are not aware that they're having their portraits painted. Though motherhood was a central theme for Cassatt, she was apparently not overly sentimental about the subject. In 1913, she denounced a plan to initiate a national holiday for mothers as absurd. Cassatt spent a lifetime defying convention. She never married, and never embraced the era's image of a woman painter as a genteel amateur. She was a person, it seems to me, of immense reserves of self-determination and character. Uh, she decided to become a professional artist very early on. Uh, despite the aversion of her father to the very idea, she decided to go to Paris to complete her education as an artist in the middle of the 1860s when hardly any Americans, men or women, were going to take that very serious professional step. Born in Pittsburgh in 1844, Cassatt early on determined to paint better than the old masters. That meant moving to Europe. Most people don't know about these incredibly early pictures from Italy and Spain and the, the sensual re you know, representations of the bullfighters. Or these fabulous opera pictures loaded with mirrors and light and glittering fans and bouquets being held by young girls and bare flesh off the shoulders. Is she as famous or as productive as Monet and Durga? No. Does she bring something that neither of them did? Yes. yes. Then, no, then it moves very James much. Wood is the director of the Art Institute of Chicago. As a man, ironically looking at her work, one of my first impressions is how tough it is. It may be that a woman painting women creates the strongest images of women we've seen for a long time. 
for wood, Cassatt's genius was modernizing religious images painted by the old masters whom she had determined to best, Madonna and child images. A man never painted a picture like that. Maybe the men were better at painting religious pictures. Maybe the men could do with the Madonna, but not the woman next door. <laughs> Cassatt wrote to a friend, I confess I love health and strength. Almost all my pictures with children have the mother holding them. Would you could hear them talk. Their philosophy would astonish you. The father figure just isn't necessary in this picture. Um, she's doing the job. Like her mentor, Edgar Dega, Cassatt worked in oil, watercolor, and pastels. You can see here in the handling of the sleeves of the nurse or the dress of the child, there's layer upon layer of chalk. And she's very, very careful to uh, use these layers without getting them muddy, which is quite, a, quite an accomplishment in pastel. If you try it yourself, you'd probably... Both shows feature Cassatt's innovative series of 10 aquatints, produced in 1890 and 91. One of the things the Impressionists were interested in were serial paintings, the idea of taking a theme and interpreting it in as many different ways as possible. And she does 10 hours in a modern Parisienne's day, from bathing the child to uh, sweeping up her coiffure to riding the tramway to have dress fitting, to letter writing. And these are mundane subjects made extraordinarily elegant and beautiful and profound. If anything, Cassatt's work has suffered from too much familiarity. Every time I see a greeting card or a calendar and I see a, a mommy and a baby on it, I think this is what people think about Mary Cassatt. And yet the purpose of doing an exhibition like this for me was to show people how much more is there. Like the artist herself, Cassatt's women heralded freedoms and complexities to come. Picasso called him the father of us all. Matisse worshipped him as a benevolent god of painting. Paul Cezanne, the very first modern painter. It's hard to imagine from this lovely but conventional self-portrait of 1875 that this young upstart in his 30s, this total outsider, was bent on breaking with tradition, setting a new course in the history of art. And yet he did. Did it in the place he loved most, his native Provence in the south of France. These works are the subject of Cézanne in Provence, a sun-bleached collection of 117 paintings and watercolors. From his early still lifes and portraits to his later landscapes and bathers. Now on view at the National Gallery in Washington. Philip Connorsby is a joint curator of the exhibition. I, I cannot think offhand, I cannot think of a painter, an artist more rooted in the environment in which he was born. And his work is in fact deeply rooted in his own time and place. To me, he's almost the last great romantic landscape painter. Paul Cezanne was born in 1839 to a prosperous family in the provincial town of Aix-en-Provence. His father encouraged him to enter law school, but he quickly realized, though France might want one more lawyer, the world needed one more artist. In 1861, he went to Paris to study and was befriended by artists like Manet, Renoir, Monet, and Pissarro. But the capital of art took little notice and he returned home to Provence to the Jazz de Buffon, his family's country estate near Aix, where he worked outdoors. Sur le motif, he called it, very simple themes. The house and its avenue of chestnut trees his live models were friends and family. This is a, a very familiar painting to, to many people, and a wonderful painting of his father. Tell, tell this is one of the, the great paintings in the exhibition. Uh, and he paints his father in the family living room at the Jaste Buffon, reading a newspaper called L'Evénement, 
which was a sort of leftish, arty newspaper. Hardly the newspaper. His father wouldn't, wouldn't read no, his father wouldn't normally read that kind of paper. So there's a little complicit joke, if you like, between father and son in this picture. And behind him, of course, is, is uh, a Cezanne. He has a wonderful little still life, uh, which we have right here in the exhibition. The paint is really heavy as if he laid it on with a trowel almost. Yes, you're using the right word. It was done actually with a painting knife, but it's laid on as if by a trowel, incredibly thick. And this was a style he adopted in the 60s, wanting to be rather provocative, you know, to, to get a reaction from people uh, to this new, bold style of painting. It was in the small fishing village of Lestoc on the Mediterranean about 20 miles from X, where he developed this new style of painting. Inspired by the strong light, he was consumed by the rich colors of Provence, the red roofs, the varying greens of the foliage, the blazing blue of water and sky. This is where Cezanne seems to become Cezanne, the artist we know. Yes, around 1880, he develops this very structured brush stroke, I mean, very precise. You can see every stroke. No one stroke represents any one thing. But of course, when you stand back, they fall into place. Well, that's where the magic is. You can almost watch the picture become a picture as you step back. Exactly. Uh, yeah. He was a man obsessed. He worked his way around the Provençal countryside, to the south, the house at Bellevue, the region round the valley of the River Arc. To the east, the villages of Garden and Payanet. In 1895, he had his first one-man show in Paris. Ridiculed by the critics and largely ignored by the public, he withdrew, becoming a recluse. He rented a room at the Chateau Noir, the Black Castle, along the road to the village of Le Tholonet. This is one of his favorite motifs. Uh, the lonely chateau set in the forest on the side of the hill. And I think to a large degree, Cezanne almost identified with it. You know, it's, it's almost a portrait of Cezanne as this lonely figure uh, in, the, in the landscape surrounded by the trees. Close to the Chateau Noir was Bibemus, an abandoned red sandstone quarry, a kind of hideaway from the Mistral, the brutal north wind. This was a place he loved to go. It was quiet, uh, very silent. And here he could almost literally penetrate the landscape of Provence. I mean, he literally goes down into the landscape. And this is a particularly wonderful example with the mountain rising, you could almost say victoriously, above the quarry in the background. That mountain, Mont saint Victoire, seemed almost hypnotic to him. He returned to it repeatedly throughout his life painting it over and over again, in every light, from every angle, in every season. Altogether, nearly 60 different views. There was almost a mystical quality that he, he seemed to feel about this mountain. Plus the fact that Cezanne just loved it, and as a child, he climbed it. So it was a place which had many layers of meaning for him. In 1902, Cezanne built a large studio on the outskirts of Aix, on the hillside of Les Loves, with a magnificent view of his beloved mountain. It was also where he painted his masterpiece, The Bathers. These are pretty lumpy women. But the trouble for him was he wasn't, frankly, that good at painting the human figure. <laughs> and uh, he was doing these purely from his imagination. He didn't have you know, attractive young women posing for him. But at the same time, it's a kind of very powerful object, and you can't deny its uh, presence, if you like. In the last years of his life, Cezanne suffered from diabetes and failing eyesight. His landscapes became more intense and abstract. His apples and pears are replaced by human skulls, the common fate of us all. His portraits are somber, like this one of his aging gardener, Monsieur Vallier. He really captures the, the, the age of the old man and uh, with his very expressive, uh, time-worn face, his gnarled hands. One senses death approaching in this painting. Death approaching, and it has a very dark, tragic air. In 1906, Cezanne wrote, 
I have sworn to myself to die painting. A month later, he was found outside, lying next to his easel, having collapsed after being soaked in a rainstorm. He was carried to town, but went back to work at his studio. He died of pneumonia a few days later at the age of 67. His work and his mountain live on. Welcome to the exhibition, Sera, 1859-1891, the first retrospective of the artist's work in over a generation. Sera excelled as a draftsman before he excelled as a painter. As you enter this room, you're moving from Paris to the seashore years of the 1880s. Don't rush to see the painting. There is a whole world of poetry and high sensibility to be enjoyed here. But it's amazing, isn't it? Wonderful. And then the Lajac. And then I have a portion of Lajac. Right. right there. Oh, and there it is. Oh, the French artist Georges Seurat died suddenly of diphtheria in 1891 at age 31. In his short life and even shorter career, he was a revolutionary who broke new ground for modern art. The just-opened exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City commemorates the 100th anniversary of his death. In this uh, culture of television where we're used to sound bites and quick images, uh, Seurat's technique is carefully calculated to slow us down, to make us look harder and longer. Curator Gary Titterow was one of the organizers of the exhibition at the Metropolitan. ...that you find in them. It's not as if he's hiding deer among the trees, uh, but rather he allows us to see these forms slowly coalescing in nature. Somebody the other day referred to Seurat as the father of television because of the idea of television picture being composed of dots. Uh -huh. uh, it, it, was, that, was that sort of the way he was thinking? He was thinking about the, what, what a picture is made up of in its, in its smaller units? He is. I mean, he was interested in the way the eye perceives things. He called his technique chromo-luminarism, and uh, although fortunately that term never took hold, uh, popularly people called it pointillism, divisionism, neo-impressionism. Um, what his term tells us is a little bit about his aspiration. He was interested in color, chromo, and luminarism. He wanted his pictures to be bright. He wanted us to perceive them as if light was emanating from them. Uh, what Seurat did was take the loose impressionist brushstroke and uh, make it regular, systematic. First in what were called the swept brushstrokes, balayer, and then in the famous dot, which were never dots. They were sometimes long, short, they varied. Always. You'll see that the dots actually blend in the eye and the scenes vibrate with a compelling luminosity. Suha began his academic education by copying engravings and reproductions of the old masters. Sura was only a so-so student. He got bad marks in school. But at age 22, did this extraordinary drawing for the Salon Show of 1883. It was the first work he exhibited in public and the first to receive critical notices. Later, fellow artists would consider him a risk-taker, an inventor. But his dress and public lifestyle were so ordinary, Degas nicknamed him the notary. Today, Seurat is so fascinating, Stephen Sondheim made him his hero in the hit Broadway musical Sunday in the Park with George, based on the creation of Seurat's most famous painting, A Sunday on La Grande Jatte, a jetty in the Seine. Still sitting red, that perfume blue, all night blue, blue, now in your shop. Dot, 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 sitting, dot, dot, waiting, dot, dot, getting, hot, dot, dot, more, dot, 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 waiting to go up, dot, dot, no, 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 George, finish the hat, finish the hat, do finish the hat, first hat, hat, hat. That painting is at the Art Institute of Chicago. And unfortunately, cannot travel. But many studies and paintings leading up to it are part of the Metropolitan Exhibit. This picture has an eerie quality, especially when you see it as you do now, knowing the final crowded composition. Well, what's he doing? Why is, what is all that about? Well, it, he, his method was kind of intuitive. He would first set his setting like a stage set, and then he decides on his troop of characters, and he moves them around like a director of a play.
Even monkeys took direction. Seurat made five sheets of preparatory monkey drawings for this painting. In addition to La Grande Jatte, three other large paintings could not be included in the show. I suggest that you step into the reading room. You'll find virtually full-size photographic reproductions of the four large paintings which could not join this exhibition. I noticed uh, you, those are all black and white reproductions. You're not yes. trying to kid anybody. But... We're not trying to kid anybody. Was there a point at which you, you thought maybe without these that you, you, you might not be able to do the exhibit? Well, there were a couple moments when uh, with, we were having troubles with our negotiations with various museums and there were conflicting programs. Uh, we thought once or twice, should we cancel or should we proceed? And we realized now that we had a great body of work and uh, there was a significant interest in the exhibition, which has been borne out in the last few weeks. There's some 185 works in the exhibition, and they chart um, Seurat's meteoric career. It spanned only 10 years, uh, starting with a school day works such as these on the left. The range is extensive, the selection vast and impressive. From these student pieces to the drawings which Seurat considered on a par with his paintings. His mother. Ordinary folk. and among his last works, large, energetic, colorful, and yet somehow muted. Full of life, this circus sideshow was called Willfully Pale and Sad. Seurat was to the end so discreet about his private life that nobody knew when this picture was exhibited that its subject was his mistress. Would it be fair to say that he was a revolutionary? Had anybody done the, these things that, that, that he did uh, before, only he just did them better, or did he really break new ground? Oh, he broke new ground, and he really was a revolutionary, and that's what the appeal of his new technique was to younger artists, because it was the promise of a system. If you divide color up into its constituent components, if you make your brush strokes regular, uh, you can be a great artist. But of course, they couldn't, because they weren't. They didn't have the talent or the genius that Seurat had. So it's not just technique? No, absolutely not. It's genius. Gustav Kaibot. Does the name sound familiar? Probably not. Kaibot was a wealthy French lawyer who, in the 1870s, embraced the radical new Impressionist movement when few others would, collecting the very best of Auguste Renoir, Claude Monet, Edgar Degas, and Alfred Sisley. But Kaibot did much, much more. Art critics say his own paintings, hidden away for a century, make him just as brilliant as his compatriots. I think when we say the quintessential Impressionist, we're meaning not just as a painter, but in all aspects of his life. Gloria Groom is co-curator of Gustav Kaibot, Urban Impressionist, on exhibit now at the Art Institute of Chicago. He not only joined them, he became one of their most important promoters and campaign managers. And afterwards, um, he left behind a body of paintings that I think are one-to-one uh, -one with some of the best paintings by a Monet or a Degas or a Cicely or a Pissarro. Kaibot's paintings show just how deeply involved he was. He did this still life as a gift for Monet, with whom he shared a passion for gardening. Reflected in the background of this 1881 self-portrait is a painting which hung on Kaibot's wall, Renoir's Ball at the Moulin de la Galette. Some believe Renoir returned the favor, capturing his friend Kaibot in this painting, Rower's Lunch. There was a tendency to think, ah, well, he was a great collector, so he couldn't but be a lesser painter. Curator Douglas Druick believes okay. that Kaibot's work remains unappreciated because it has not been seen. Two-thirds of the paintings in this exhibit are still in private hands, mostly those of his descendants. 
For years, this one painting, Floor Scrapers, was the only Kaibat that was known, and only because the executor of his will, Auguste Renoir, insisted that it be included in the collection of Impressionist masterpieces which Kaibat left to France. Even when shown in the company of avant-garde Impressionist works, this painting caused an uproar. It was a big picture. And it was a big picture with what was seen to be a relatively small subject, urban laborers. It wasn't until the 1960s that the veil of secrecy began to lift when the Art Institute of Chicago bought Kaibat's massive painting, Paris Street, Rainy Day. The question was, who is Kaibat, and why would the Art Institute of Chicago want such a big picture that will take up so much wall space? Um, as it's turned out, it was a brilliant acquisition, and that became a sort of point of advocacy for the artist. That advocacy culminated in this, the largest international retrospective of Kaibat's work. The show drew record crowds in Paris, and this summer, it moves on to the Los Angeles County Art Museum. For his inspiration, Kaibot looked to the streets of Paris. It would be as if today, here in Chicago, the artist celebrated the very sights one takes for granted. The buildings, the people, the mysteries of daily life. He is called the urban impressionist because that's mostly what he painted. The boulevards and intersections of Paris. Its rooftops. Everything one could see or fantasize from an apartment balcony. Who is the lady this man is watching? Who across the way is returning this woman's gaze? He seems so attuned to detail. And I think that's one thing I find in his work. It's very, for me, it's very sensuous. It's very um, uh, satisfying. He looks at contemporary life through a different lens. He, he, introduces an edge into his pictures. Because he was wealthy, Kaibot could afford to take risks, experimenting with a strange new point of view below his balcony. He could paint this male nude and when so only female nudes food were selling. Food displayed in windows. He could show fruit Kaibot. as it really looked at the market, or a calf at the butcher's these. shop. Yeah. By yeah. contrast, Monet's still life so paintings much. were safer and more saleable. So he just stopped showing his artwork, just simply stopped. He really just showed it for eight years and that was it. And then just painted for his own pleasure. Eventually, the battles around and between the Impressionists grew tiring, and Kaibot left Paris to pursue new passions gardening, building and racing speedboats. Now, how, are, how do these fit into the overall work? These are the very uh, last paintings he did. Preparation for a decorative ensemble he was making for his dining room at Petit Genevieve, where he lived. A century after his death, Kaibot is finally basking in a spotlight he never saw in life. We feel that this is um, an a fresh look at an artist who's so little known um, in art history classes because slides weren't available, so you never learned about Kayabat, and I think that's all going to change. The first thing to know is it was hot in Brooklyn, 95 degrees hot. And so the sign outside the Brooklyn Museum of Art was intriguing. It's snowing inside, it said. How can you resist that kind of come on? We went inside, and it was snowing. There they were, almost 60 paintings of winter scenes by some of the most famous French Impressionists of the 19th century. The first time these works have been seen together in one show. The exhibition is called Impressionists in Winter, a fait de neige. The people inside clearly enjoyed the change in the weather. It is a pure coincidence of scheduling, but it turns out the hotter the day, the more people come, so that's very good. And, Elizabeth uh, Easton is the curator well, of the exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum of Art, which runs through August 29th. Well, the interesting thing about the Impressionist painters is that they went out into nature 
to try and look at reality in a new way, not in their studios, but out in nature. You're looking at Cart on the Snowy Road at Honfleur, Claude Monet's very first effet de neige, that is, literally, effect of snow. It was 1865. In less than 10 years, this obscure young painter and his avant-garde colleagues would mount a series of revolutionary exhibitions that would prompt a glib critic to coin the sarcastic term Impressionism. There are paintings by Camille Pissarro and Paul Gauguin, who you normally expect to see in the South Pacific, even a Cezanne and a Renoir, and several wonderful works by the less well-known Alfred Sisley and Gustave Caillebotte. Many of Caillebotte's winter scenes were painted from the windows of his fourth floor apartment on the elegant new Boulevard Haussmann, named after the man who redesigned the French capital under Napoleon III. Also, the quality of the paint on the canvas makes you see the immediacy of the balcony and the snow on the balcony, which looks like it's just come from the tube of paint. It's so thick, you can see exactly how the artist put it on. This is one of the best, strongest, most memorable Sisleys that I've ever seen. What he does as a painter, he can't make the sky the brightest part of the picture. He makes the snow the brightest part of the picture. So we read the day, it's very clear. But it's really the activity of his brush here and the pinks and blues and purples and turquoises that he paints the snow that make the composition really explode, as well as this triangular shadow that is so stark and so dramatic that it really stays in your mind. And this is a, this is a Renoir. This is the only Renoir in the exhibition. Renoir's snow scenes are rare because he hated winter weather. Well, you know what he does? He kind of makes it the same kind of scene that he would have painted of spring and summer of people enjoying themselves at their leisure activities. Well, this looks like a little uh, a hockey, hockey game yeah, and a, hockey puck and a, a hockey, little dog uh, in the middle. And here you yeah. see somebody being actually pushed. We stopped at Claude Monet's The Red Cape, a painting of his longtime okay. model and then wife Camille. It's one of my favorites and Elizabeth Easton's. This is one of Monet's most astonishing paintings. The first time I saw it, I never forgot it because it's so spare and lush at the same time. He does a lot of things that help us to understand that it is a momentary vision of her walking by the door, that he paints most of her on one side of the French door and just this little stroke of red of her cape and the little corner of her blue outfit indicate she's that moving. she's walking across the yeah. It is, of course, Monet who dominates the show at the Brooklyn Museum, both in the sheer number of paintings and in artistry. This work is simply called Frost. This is a truly astonishing picture, an artistic tour de force that totally immerses us in a world of wind-whipped branches and sparkling snow. Two Monet paintings are called The Breakup of the Ice. And this one, Sunset on the Seine in Winter. Monet was, at this point, not able to sell any of his paintings at all. And he would make desperate trips into Paris. Imagine that. that Imagine that. But still acknowledged as the great painter of Impressionism at the time, and unable to, I mean, they even struggled, they say, to buy a sack of potatoes. It was that desperate. Then his wife dies. So this, this was done at a time when his inner landscape was... Uh, pretty bleak, yeah. pretty bleak. And so, He's moved farther away from Paris, and his paintings as well move farther away from these observations of modern life to, as you can see in this picture, a more meditative, more contemplative kind of landscape. In 1885, Monet wrote to his dealer, I am in the snow up to my neck. I have a whole series of paintings in progress. I have only one fear, that the weather may change. And because of Monet and the others, we too are in the snow up to our necks, while outside it is 95 degrees. This is Renoir's The Bathers. The art critic for the New York Times says it looks like two croissants on a plate of greens, not a compliment. 
But the painter Matisse said that it was probably it was among the greatest works of art ever painted. The painting is the centerpiece of an exhibition of his late works, currently at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Here's the Los Angeles Times review. It says, late Renoir is bad Renoir. Take that. It is sort of almost a, it's a, it's a given that is simply, simply not hip to like these pictures. Joe Rischel is a senior curator at the Philadelphia Museum. I love Le Renoir and I always have, since I find myself being getting my dukes up and saying, we're trying to sh revisit this. Who knew that Renoir could get people so riled up? Pierre-Auguste Renoir is still admired for paintings like these, icons of Impressionism, busy with brush strokes, dappled with light, alive with color. But in the 1880s, he changed. He finally has the means to travel, and so he goes to Italy and he goes to Algeria. And these are just amazing opportunities for him to, to see different parts of the world, and particularly in Italy to be confronted by the works of the great sort of Renaissance artists. Paintings by Titian, Raphael, Rubens, Velazquez, among others. He actually decides that he doesn't know how to paint and he doesn't know how to draw, that he has to re completely rethink his style. Jennifer Thompson co-curated the late Renoir show. A series of reclining nudes um, that Renoir does starting in about 1903. Meaning he becomes obsessed with painting flesh. Right, Renoir often spoke about how he loved models whose skin took the light and you get a great sense of a sort of glowing flesh here. He was quoted as saying, when I've painted a woman's bottom so that I want to touch it, then the painting is finished. These are precisely the paintings critics today love to hate. How so this is it? about sensuality. It certainly is. And I'm sure in a certain way that every day is Sunday, Blythe, if you're that happy, you must be superficial. It's the Doris Day phenomenon. You can't have any talent if you're doing that sort of thing. But while he was alive, and for decades after his death, Renoir's late work was prized. Um, they're almost all Renoir. The one at the very top, you've got Renoir, and then the three across, Renoir, Renoir, Renoir. Martha Lucy is associate curator of the Barnes Foundation outside of Philadelphia. How many Renoirs are there in the Barnes Foundation? There are 181 in the collection, and it's the biggest collection in the world. About 85% are from after 1890 and 50% are from the very last decade of Renoir's career. Dr. Albert Barnes invented Argerol, an antiseptic used in the eyes of newborn babies. With the money he made, Barnes assembled one of the finest collections anywhere of Impressionist and early modern art. In a letter to another collector in 1913, Barnes wrote, I am convinced I cannot get too many Renoirs. So what happened? 1910 to 1919, you know, the last decade of his life, he was considered by many critics to be the, the greatest living painter. And I think that what happens is um, around 1950, there's this shift in taste. I think that modern art starts to be understood as something that has to be difficult, um, challenging. Something Renoir's paintings were not. He painted the snug world around him, again and again using his wife's cousin Gabrielle as his model. He dressed his children in elaborate costumes. He seemed to be a man in denial. This is just at the end of his life. And the war is on. Um, and you can see he's a rather enfeebled fellow now with his hands very doubled over with this horrible, horrible arthritic condition he had. But he's having the time of his life. But look at what it takes him to paint. This extraordinary film is part of the Philadelphia Exhibition. It was shot in 1915, in the middle of World War I. Two of Renoir's sons had been wounded in battle. His wife had just died. Matisse asked his friend, why torture yourself? Renoir's reply, the pain passes, but beauty endures. By that last difficult decade of his life, Renoir had moved from Paris to the south of France, hoping for relief. Confined to a wheelchair, he lived to paint. Instead of reality, 
he painted these sunny fantasies, one after another, always experimenting with how he applied his paints. At around the same time, this is what Matisse was doing. Picasso's work had already begun to look like this. And yet, both of these much edgier artists owned paintings by Renoir and learned from them. You know, the colors are kind of applied in these blocks, almost, um, which you see Matisse doing later on. Matisse and Picasso thought Renoir's later paintings were beautiful. But are they? Or are today's critics right? And one of the things that you see over and over again is comparisons of his paintings to um, cream puffs and to um, like frosting. You know, it's like too many calories in a Renoir. He did more than 4,000 pictures in his lifetime. There were 700 in his studio on the day he died, at the age of 78, on December 3rd, 1919. That morning, he said, I think I'm beginning to know something about painting. You decide. No matter how much we explain the pictures and try to, try to draw attention into what makes them do what they're doing, Dick has a great art because the magic remains and the magic is inexplicable. Once again, the magic of a French Impressionist master is drawing huge crowds to the Art Institute of Chicago. Would you care for an audio tour? Yes. Okay, you can come this way. Visitors are in for a shock. Yes, there are a few of the delicately detailed dancers which everyone identifies with the Impressionist Edgar Degas. This lively, colorful drawing from 1883 is a classic example of Degas' Impressionist style. Notice how specifically he captures every detail. But this time, curator Douglas Druick shatters all our preconceived notions and spotlights the radical charcoals, pastels, and sculptures which the artist produced in the last 30 years of his life, the 30 years that took Degas beyond Impressionism. This is a great late drawing by Degas, and it has all the hallmarks of, way, of what make the drawing so very special. Uh, Degas is not only describing form, he's actually conveying the sense of the energy that these forms exude in their movement. She's repositioned, he's redrawn, and with this wonderful blur, with this sort of halo of energy that these drawings exude, we feel the vitality of the human figure, and that's what he wanted. One of Degas' last signed oil paintings is titled Freeze of Dancers. This is modern art. It has nothing to do with Impressionism. That this is not a window onto the world. It is a two-dimensional surface covered with lines and colors arranged in a certain order. It was the beginning of that modernist aesthetic that a painting is a painting. A painting is in a window. And that, is, that makes this very 20th century critiquing his colleague, Edgar Degas. The artist Renoir once said, if Degas had died at 50, he would be remembered as an excellent painter, no more. It is after his 50th year that his work broadened out and that he really becomes Degas. He had come to a point in his life where the question was, do I continue doing what I've done so well, or do I do something different? Now, the brave thing is to try to reinvent yourself, and that's what Degas did. From 1886 on, Degas attacked his canvases, often dabbing the paint directly onto the surface with his fingers. Armed with new, jewel-like, chemically-derived colors, Degas encrusted his pastels. As guest curator Richard Kendall notes, Degas was able to achieve a never-before-seen effect. So he'll put down one layer of color, say a blue, He'll fix that, and then he'll put another color on top, so it may be orange. And when you're looking at his picture, you're looking at a kind of orange-blue or blue-orange, which, which will be an electric kind of color experience, which you can't get in any other way. In the 1890s, Degas began to experiment with photography, posing his models in pools of shadow and light. 
and to get even further inside their forms, he sculpted nudes in varied poses and then drew them over and over and over again. He himself said that he made the sculptures in order to imbue the drawings and the pastels with greater life and greater vitality. And I think that we now see that in this self-created world, the self-sustaining world that Degas made of his atelier, of his studio, the sculptures often functioned as models. Degas saw himself as a bridge between the past and the future. In his late work, you can see hints of Gauguin and Picasso. Somebody like Picasso um, was utterly, utterly fascinated by what Degas was doing in the early 20th century picked up some of his themes and rather like the relay race idea, he takes the baton and he runs on with it. Degas' vibrantly red painting, Combing the Hair, was done in homage to the 16th century giant Titian. 20th century master Henri Matisse later owned it. He's thinking with all those fingerprints of Titian uh, and he's thinking while he's making modern art. So it's that wonderful ability to look back while being in the present and making an art that looks forward. Degas' fabled crankiness comes out in his rivalry with fellow impressionist giant Claude Monet. Degas dismissed Monet's water lilies as mere decoration, and he complained that the seaside was more Monet than my eyes can stand. Partly to tweak Monet, Degas put his own twist on landscapes. In the 1890s, he abandoned his ballet dancers for Russian peasants in a field. And in this painting, Steep Coast, he placed one of his nudes on her back to create the impression of undulating hills. And what Degas is saying, I can do this. Just watch. I can do this as well. Why has it taken 80 years for scholars to tackle Degas' late work? It seems a bit difficult, a bit unfinished, sometimes a bit shocking. So I, I guess people have tended to steer away from it a bit. How difficult, how shocking? Shocking in the sense that it's often very intimate. It's about um, naked bodies in private spaces. We see women apparently in their own private world. This is their bedroom or their bathroom. And it's, it has been said that we, we, we feel uncomfortable because we're there, we're peeping. Um, and that can make people a little uncertain. Clearly, Degas was obsessed with the female form. Yet it seems he had little intimate knowledge of his favorite subject. The fact is that he was celibate. He didn't have a settled relationship with a woman throughout his life. But he was clearly obsessed by every aspect of women. Um, how they looked, how they walked, how they behaved, what they did in private, what they did in public. Uh, and he spent really half his life as an artist making pictures of women. And as Degas aged, his women did too. These are older women. They're heavier. They're more mature. And he concentrates more on the efforts involved in their rehearsal and their performance. It's as if they, like he, are feeling the weight and the burden of time and the impinging physical frailty. For the next two months, visitors to Chicago's Art Institute can relish the creative tension, the final chapter of an old master's life. Late Degas is great Degas. And the first chapter of modern art. Ah, the beautiful fleeting moments of light that define Impressionism. Quick, name an Impressionist. Perhaps you said Monet, or maybe Cezanne, Degas, or Renoir. Can you name an American Impressionist? Does the name Child Hassam spring to mind? Probably not. But at the turn of the 20th century, it would have. Hassam was extremely popular in his own time. He was deemed the leading American Impressionist. Barbara Weinberg organized the retrospective of Hassam's work, currently at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. He certainly is not a household name. I'm hoping to make him one. Weinberg says he deserves to be, because Child Hassam was pivotal in changing American tastes. 
When he went to Paris to study in 1886, he was one of the very few of the many American art students in Paris who were really open to the new French painting. He brought his taste for French Impressionism home, and he was instrumental in jump-starting American Impressionism on these shores. Just as in French Impressionism, a sense of exact time and place permeates Hassam's paintings. He came from an old Yankee family and relished quintessentially American scenes. He was patriotic. He was interested in expressing in his works what was America about America. Like Gloucester Harbor, or the coast of Maine, or a New England church, capturing a mood like lazing on a summer afternoon. Hassam always looked at his world through rose-colored glasses. It's really one of the facts of his approach and, in fact, it's quite typical of American Impressionism. Hassam lived and painted in New York City and nearby East Hampton on the Long Island shore. He portrayed the city frequently, usually as a dynamic, happy place. Though in later paintings, New York was viewed from indoors, almost as if it had become overwhelming. Child Hassam was prolific producing many thousands of works. He only painted to make a living. He didn't teach, he didn't take commissions for portraits or murals, he abandoned illustration, he simply painted, showed, and sold. And he had a tremendously successful career from a financial standpoint, died with literally millions. But until now, the one thing he'd always hoped for eluded him a major one-man show at the city's premier museum. In 1909, he wrote rather longingly, if only the Met would organize a large exhibition of an American Impressionist, and I think he meant himself at that point, it would be tremendously popular and show what American Impressionists could do. Emphasis on American. And therein lies the irony of Child Hassam's career. Even though the leading American Impressionist, he was nevertheless upstaged by comparison to the French masters. He was something other than Monet, not just a clone. So it might especially please him that the most enduring of his images is a series of American flag paintings. You're a grand old flag, you're a high-flying flag, and for During World War I, Fifth Avenue was festooned with flags. It was considered the most important street in America, so these displays supporting the Allies were reported around the world. Hassan painted 30 oils of the flags. This is one of Hassan's earliest and one of his very best flag paintings. It shows the 4th of July, 1916. The subtitle for 4th of July is the greatest display of American flags ever seen in New York. Which meshes perfectly with a comment Child Hassan made a few years earlier when asked his credo for making art. I believe the man who will go down to posterity is the man who paints his own time and the scenes of everyday life around him. Does each one kind of bring you back to a specific memory and scene? Yes. At the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, actor. This is like a relic, I can't get over that. An artist come face to face. Once upon a time, in another time, he was right here, you know. Willem Dafoe studies a self-portrait of Vincent van Gogh. And I see the marks, you know. I laugh when people say, you look like van Gogh, from portrait to portrait, uh -huh. he looks very different. It's a remarkable close encounter that extends beyond the exhibit space to the big screen where Defoe plays the painter in At Eternity's Gate, a new film about the final months of Van Gogh's tortured and brilliant life. My job title, manager. And There's in a, a prolific stage and film career spanning 40 years, with parts ranging from soldiers. We are who we choose to be. To supervillains. Defoe says nothing compares to this. 
When I look at nature, I see more clearly. It takes me I loved this movie, and it was a beautiful experience to make. He changed you? Of course. How did Van Gogh change you? How did the film change you? It changes how I see, and not just painting, but how I see things in life. There's something inside me. I don't know what it is. What I see, nobody else sees it. That new perspective includes a different way to approach this almost mythical figure. Unlike previous movies, this one focuses on what he created, not the madness that consumed him. Yes, he had lots of challenges, no doubt about that. But he was also productive then. He was painting practically a painting a day. And you can tell from his letters how happy he was, his feeling of seeing something that's beautiful. But I remember At 63, I, Defoe is 26 years older than Van Gogh at the time of his death. Thing. In your mind, it was Willem Defoe. It was always going to be Willem. But for director Julian Schnabel, he was destined for the role. He became something else. I don't think it's a performance. He was the incarnation of something. He invited me over to the house. They put a, a, a beard on me and shot pictures. And I think he sat with those images for a little while, and then shortly after, he said, let's do this thing. And it seems only fitting that the controversial Schnabel, a filmmaker and painter known for his outsized art and personality, would take on this larger-than-life subject. I wanted to make a movie that wasn't about Van Gogh, but I wanted the audience to feel what it was to be him. Schnabel has the fame and fortune that Van Gogh never had in life, but the 67-year-old, whose works have sold for millions, says the Dutch painter achieved something truly priceless. This thing about in the film is it kind of talks about really what success is. I, for one, think that Van Gogh was successful because he achieved what he wanted to do. He is his paintings. And those paintings are still conversing with us. And that is, I'd say that's a huge success. Much of At Eternity's Gate was filmed on location in the south of France, with Defoe retracing Van Gogh's footsteps. It's a good feeling when you look out on the landscape and it's almost recognizable. As for the still lifes, landscapes, and portraits, Schnabel did most of them, but not all. I wanted to see the shoes. I know they're yeah, in the other okay, room. Okay, let's find them. Defoe showed us the Van Gogh work he recreated, with some advice from Schnabel. Julian coached me on painting the shoes. This is why, even though when I'm painting, I'm not painting necessarily in the style of Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. I'm painting, but there are things I recognize. <laughs> you know, like the laces, how, how freely you do you do. You know, you One stroke. exactly. Gosh, wow. Yeah. You look at the painting for a minute. To regard the tableau, on second. This is Schnabel's sixth film, but with his paintings hanging alongside works by 19th century masters at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. Wow, it's nice low, also. It's clear the canvas will always be his calling. Will you ever stop painting? No, I can't stop painting because. Uh, if there's anything, the way I mediate the world is through painting. I mean, if I, my, my way of living or reason to live is to do that. Why do you paint? I paint as a matter of fact, to stop thinking. Defoe's performance has drawn raves, and he's been nominated for a Golden Globe Award for Best Actor, a first for him. This is a moment for you. Do you think I'm now being <laughs> acknowledged for my work as a leading male? It's nice. Yeah. It's nice. And um, it feels comfortable, too. Is it a great uh, role of a lifetime? For now, let's say yes.